just got to have a steady hand and a steady eye to make uh, to make these floats. Yeah. So anyway, coming back to um, the Italians, uh, I was fishing in. Um, I think it was where was it? Hungary. That's right, Hungary. And um, I uh, when we used to fish the World Championships, we used to um, t take our own uh, baits, our own maggots across. And um, do you know what? Uh, our maggots were were the envy of all the teams in the world because um, we were very successful in in exporting them. Uh, with us or taking taking them with us and um how we used to do it um it was quite simple we used to uh, simply take the air off them put them in bags put them in polystyrene boxes obviously cool them right down and they would last a, a few days before we'd open them up and we'd have them anyway um cut long story short we were upon the uh the venue and fishing away and we had all this beautiful bait laid out uh, laid out on the ground and we had uh, casters and um uh you know all being uh, uh sort of being sieved off and who should come along was uh um not milo colombo he was very friendly with milo but uh it was um trabuco and trabuco a float manufacturer who used to make these floats come along and he seen our casters and he said oh what do you want for them he said oh nothing we, we you know we, we we're happy to give you some like he said um anyway we give him a couple of pints and um uh they, he was so grateful in fact he came back afterwards and gave me a big bag of floats and there was a load of these uh these floats in there fantastic do you know what i've got to tell you as well um they're so professional, some of these teams um, abroad. Um, I don't know whether it's ethical or not, but I remember um, creeping up behind the Italian team on one occasion, and um, they they were actually gutting the fish they caught. Not all of them, just a few, gutting them to see what they were actually eating, what the you know um, what type of food they were eating mainly. You know, whether it's the bloodworm or the joker or maggots, casters, or whatever it was, inside their stomach. Uh, I don't know whether that's ethical, because obviously you're going to you're killing fish. But I suppose, being professional, they wanted to know exactly what they were eating. I, I know that um, trout anglers can actually spoon down the throat and find out that way, but I think the Italians went a little bit over the top by obviously, you know, knocking uh, uh, the fish on the head and actually finding out what they've been eating. But anyway, um, that year, I can honestly say that uh, they didn't win. <laughs> um, I actually won the second day, believe it or not. Under the old rules, I would have been world champion, but uh, after I become world champion, they changed the rules and you have to um, um, win over both days or uh, come highly placed over, over the two days. Um, to win the championships, but anyway, um, it was interesting. So I used a float there, which uh, I will be making at a later date. Um, that catches fish from the surface right down to the bottom. And it's a very slow sinking uh, um, Bristol type of float. Um, but again, more about that in another video. So don't forget to come back. <laughs> yeah, I'm just doing the smaller float now. Yes, I had some great fun uh, fishing the World Championships, going to Italy on Florence and uh, thinking about these floats now and <laughs> hooking up with a couple of the Italians and uh, they were going along in the evening down the promenade and uh, I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> it was full of like lady boys and I tell you, well, they were beautiful, they were absolutely beautiful. <laughs> but they were they kept flashing their their uh their what's this, their private parts was <laughs> I think it was I think it was Tom, yeah, I remember Tom Pickering telling me, he said, Oh yeah, if you're gonna turn gay, that's the place you wanna turn gay in that country. 
<laughs> but yeah, hey, yeah, neeps. He used to love going there. <laughs> oh, Leon. Uh, he's retired now, Ian. He's actually living in Wales. Doing quite well, I think, down on his fisheries. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, it also brings back memories of old Ray Mumford as well. Old Ray. What a great guy. Again, he was another angler, well advanced of his years in techniques and methods. Uh, we were, well, he actually came over with us, the Welsh team, uh, one year on the Arno, and uh, we were doing a bit of practicing. And he showed me something that I think was quite amazing, really. We were actually catching carp um, without actually throwing any ground bit in, just by throwing stones in the water, little pebbles around our float. And obviously, it must be the vibration and the the the, the sound and the, and the physical um, stone falling through the water that actually uh, attracted the fish to the bait. And we were catching loads of them, much more than anybody else around us. Oh, good old Ray! <laughs> Tell you some more stories about Ray. The right character. <laughs> Okay, um, smaller float now. I'm just about to finish off. Uh, this is the smallest one in the in the range of the whip floats. Um, as I said before, it's um, not 25 grams. It's oh, 0. 0.25 or 25 quarter of a gram. <laughs> there you go. Um, just going to introduce a very fine bristle. Yeah, I see very fine into the top there you are yeah so there's the float almost finished um what i'll do i'll just put a bit of super glue glue it in uh right um all right quite often when i make these floats i usually um put the white bit on the top first before I actually do any um, bristle work on the top but uh, um, in fact yeah uh, I'm going to leave that for a second because I'm going to show you the best way to to do that because rather than try and paint around the bristle you're better off putting the white t um, color on the top before you even you know uh, put the bristle in so I'll leave that for a second um, well, I've already done this one so <laughs> unfortunately I'll have to sort of paint around that one uh, but generally I would I wouldn't do with that I, I would paint the top first before putting the bristle in uh, anyway okay let me put that by there I'm just going to do the the next one which is the, uh, the half a gram well um, right let me just get a better flat surface if I can yeah I suppose it's all about eye coordination isn't it you know and you know, when you do these small floats and as I said before I um, obviously computer generated floats these days um, I've seen these floats churned out dozens dozen at a time you know uh, they put the long um, dowel in a machine and it sort of tapes it and, and it just pops out on the other end <laughs> but uh, I suppose that's why they can make them so cheaply then um, as I said, as I mentioned, perhaps in a previous video, you know, by the time uh, it, the time it takes me to make a float, uh, you know, could certainly not make a living on it. <laughs> it's just a little bit of pocket money, I suppose, when I do it for people. Um, as I said, I do enjoy doing them. Okay, uh, right. I'm just going to show you now quickly. I use a cotton wool bud, dipped it in a bit of paint, white acrylics, and I'm just going to put a little bit on the top, like that. Okay. I'm going to let that uh, stand to dry, and, and I'm going to put the bristle in then, uh, once I've done that. In fact, I could do that now, uh, because the paint then acts like a bit of a, a glue. 
that will hold the bristle in. So, um, so I got. Slightly thicker bristle for the slightly bigger float. There you go. Okay, put that to one side to dry. Now, obviously, I've got this one there which I didn't paint. Um, uh, so I shall try and skirt around that if I can. okay I'll have to finish that off afterwards by painting the obviously the body's going to be black anyway so right so there you go I'll just put them to one side and let that dry for a minute and then uh, I'll put some dope on it and um, that will seal the the pores if you like in the wood and create like a, a barrier so uh, ready for painting okay I, uh, I may have mentioned before about the, f the paint I use. It's a granite paint that uh, creates like a hard shell on the actual float, like an outer skin. So I'm going to paint these now. Uh, I'm, now I'm starting from the base of the float upwards. And the reason being is that I want to be extra careful when it comes to the top of the float because um as you remember i've painted it white on the base on the, the very top of it so i'm going to use small strokes which should color the float but without the bristles of the brush going on to the white so there we are. yep there we are. that's all done so put that into my little flower box same again here start off from the base down the float Done again. And now for the baby one. Now, what I find uh, with the smaller float is um, it's more of a, I suppose, uh, a surface float than the others because uh, obviously you haven't got much weight on these. But uh, ideal if you're bleak fishing and uh, you know. And you're catching fish on the surface. Um, remember catching some dates once on the surface using these floats. Perfect. There you go. Okay, I let them go. Uh, let them dry now, and I'll come back and uh, um, I shall put the capacity on the side of them and varnish them up. Okay, well, what I've done, I've actually let them dry overnight, um, just so that they're 100% dry and uh, it's created, as I said, this nice tough coating. Now what I will do, um, I'll just smooth any rough areas down, um, because sometimes this paint does tend to uh, clog slightly, uh, in drips I should say, so I'm just double checking. Um, as I say, it's one of the best paints I've ever used for uh, painting floats. So it's worth a little bit of extra work just to, you know, smooth them down and get them dead right. You know, so so, not, so hopefully after varnish, varnishing, there'll be a nice glossy finish on them. 
well not too glossy but more of a matte finish there you are so that's that um, but they're almost finished now these floats as I said all I'm going to do then is to uh, put them mark the capacity on the side of them and then I will varnish them over and they'd be ready for use there you are. so let me just double check now make sure yeah, a bit of touching up by there it's okay and there's okay uh, yeah. There you go. Right now, let's put some uh, markings on the side with the uh, pilot pen. As I've mentioned before, uh, it's like a liquid paper paint that dries very much like Tipex, I suppose, but of course with a very fine tip to it. So. As I said, but you know the. Uh, I will double check these in the glass, um, just in case the measurements are out. So there you are. I just put that on there. See if you can see that. And then this is all point five oh. Five oh. No point two. Okay. One other thing, just to finish them off, I did mention early on uh, about a little file on the wire. So I'm just going to just smooth the edges round. So obviously, when we put the float rubbers on, uh, they'll go onto the the wire stem smoothly. A little point, a little point to them. Now, I also mentioned that I will talk about some tactics and methods with these floats. Now, the quality of fish that we that we're looking to catch with these type of floats are usually bleak and gudgeon. Now, of course, you can catch dace and roach and anything else on them, really. Um, in fact. Um, I know somebody uses uses them on commercials, but uh, I don't know whether they're strong enough to actually um, take the bashing that you get with when you're carp fishing. You know, I think you I think really you should stick to the commercial type of floats, uh, which are tougher carbon stems and that. Which I do make, by the way. <laughs> okay, right there you go. Right, so now what I'm going to do now um, I will. Uh, put a bit of varnish on them and, and let them to dry so uh, that'll be in my next stage again I'll be putting the varnish on quite liberally uh, making sure that I don't actually cover the eye on the top otherwise if you do uh, it's just a simple matter of piercing the varnish in the eye with a, a small pin anyway, so it's no big deal. Okay, so there's the one float. There's the second one. So I might put another coat on later on, but I'll let it dry for a while. Um, right, if there's any questions anybody wants to ask me, then feel f free to uh, put them in the comments below. Otherwise, uh, don't forget to give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Whichever way you want to go. But uh, what I'd like you to do is share it, of course, with your friends. Share the channel. Because uh, obviously the more subscribers I get, 
obviously the more hits I get, which will be beneficial to me. Okay. Okay, now I've come to the uh, the part of the video, which I know a lot of people have been waiting for, and that's the methods and techniques that uh, that we use using this float. Um, right, as I mentioned before, uh, bleak being the dominant species of fish in a lot of waters these days, a lot of anglers actually go for the match anglers. Um, okay, I know the specimen guys and the, the guys who like cat figure fish, it doesn't really uh, rock their boat, so to speak. But for the match angler, it's very important sometimes um, to go for these bleak because they can actually win matches. Um, and it's been proven on many times. I've uh, fished in the River Wye, for example, and uh, somebody's concentrated on the, on the dace and, and the roach, and they're, they're catching, you know, they might catch 10, 20 pounds of them. But I tell you what, if you concentrate on the bleak, um, and I know they're only small, usually about 30 to a pound, you can normally catch more of them than you catch the roach. Uh, and, you know, end up with 20, 30 pound. Um, I think the records uh, on the Y, by Adrian Will, I think, he might have 50 odd pound, I think. Anyway, but some huge weights, some huge weights to be caught catching bleak. And of course, again, sometimes um, on other rivers, winter leagues and, and things where bleak will still feed and other fish won't. So, you know, again, it's um, it's, it's an important float in the match t uh, tackles box. Now, I'm going to show you this diagram that I've uh, put together, which basically gives you the outline of the float. Um, which you've already seen anyway on the video. These ones were made by Trabuco. Uh, as I said, I had these uh, these off him initially um, a few years a few years ago now. Now the the technique. There are a couple of ways to shop these up. The Italians in particular like to fish for their uh, bleak uh, quite deep, and the reason being is that uh, when they uh, pull or strike into a fish and, and they don't make any contact all they do is flick the float back and it, it's, it stays in the water basically so you're not wasting your time lifting it out of the water which is obviously wasting uh, valuable seconds and over a, a match period that can amount to you know quite a few lost uh, minutes and moments so the idea is is to actually lift into the fish or strike once you get your bite and then uh, if there's not a fish on, the, on the, it you just let it more or less go back into the water um, by lifting and, and sort of flicking. So you're spending more, uh, the bait, spending more time in the water, more chance of catching more fish. And the way they actually shot it is quite unusual because they usually put an olivet, as you can see it by the diagram, down the, the bottom part of the line, followed by a string of small shots. Now, this is quite an unusual um, sort of shotting pattern for most however it works it works fantastic and i have seen these uh, italian guys fishing um uh, for bleak and catching five to six a minute now i uh, i challenge anyone uh, any uk angler to to be as quick as they are i mean obviously there's some youngsters these days who could probably compete but basically um this it's uh, this sort of shotting pattern doesn't tangle uh, which is Quite, and it's more of a direct um, uh, is to the fish. It's, it's going directly to the fish without uh, too much line. As you can see, it's shotted in. Um, actually, this uh, is demonstrates how you lift up when you get the bite. And if obviously no fish on the end, you just simply drop it and and back into the same position, waiting for the uh, the fish to take it. Okay. Now that's. That's the Italian way. Now, the way I do it, especially on the Y, I actually shot it like a shirt button along the line from the float to the hook, spacing it about every six inches. And the reason why, bleak are attracted by the splash. Now, if you splash the float onto the water, quite often it'll attract the bleak uh, right there because it's the sound and they think they're associated with food feeding uh, obviously you th throw some maggots in at the same time but sometimes you can actually do it without feeding because they got used to the splash and feeding you like educating them every time now 
Coming back to the float itself, there, there is a reason why it's painted white on the, the top. And that is, when you sh shot this float, you shot it down to the bristle. So uh, the actual um, top of the float is just on the surface of the water. Now, obviously, if you get a lift bite, then it's going to stay proud. But when you get a bite, it will actually go under. And they're very, very sensitive. Now, the thing is, you can actually hold back th this as well in the water in a flowing river. So as you're holding it back and the bait's lifting, you, you can get your bite and you obviously strike and you, you, you'll have the fish on there. And you again... By fishing downstream, you can you got the same uh, scenario where you don't have to lift it out the water. What we call whipping, <laughs> you're actually keeping it in the water. So every time you bring it in, you've actually got a fish on. Um, obviously, the eye on the top is important, so the the line goes through the eye, uh, down through the bottom onto a small sleeve. Um, this uh, method that I use works well. In fact, I've uh, if you've been following my fishing vlogs, my match vlogs, you'll actually see me actually using them and, and catching Blake. Uh, I'm just getting to grips with that uh, body camera, by the way, because most of the time people be saying, all they see is my knee. <laughs> but next time I'll obviously try and... Uh, in fact, I've ordered another body camera, so if I have two running, at least I'll, I get some action of the fish. Anyway, okay. Well, look, that's about it now, as far as the... Uh, uh, the whip, uh, Italian whip float is concerned. I um, hope you've enjoyed watching this bit and uh, come back and see the next one. Uh, I, um, I've got a couple of orders. I'll check out which float I'm going to make next. But when I do, come back, see how I do it. And again, we'll have a little chit chat. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe and share the channel for me. Cheers now.